Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think we have some children here as well. On behalf Black of Princess. the Philippines, this is Bambina Olivares, Director of Programming, welcoming you to today's workshop with A to A Safaris in the Wild, a photo photographic journey through Africa, Latin America, and Antarctica. So here we're going to capture, learn how to capture nature at its most majestic, from endangered, endangered wildlife to colorful bird, li bird life, to real landscapes and vanishing tribes. So, so our um, chief wildlife explorer today is Jose Cortez III, also known as Lit. And he's taking us on a Zoom safari to learn about different angles to shoot wildlife species, including how to take great shots on your mobile phones in the habitats that they live in, in Africa, South America, and the Antarctic. Before we begin, just a few ground rules. This webinar is being recorded and will be up on the Manila House YouTube channel in a day or so. Please use the chat box for any questions and comments and we'll get your questions as we go along. Um, if you'd like to speak, please raise your hand and speak. You're all, um, this is a meeting format so we can all see you if you want to be seen and you can speak anytime. Um, so let me just introduce you to Lit Cortez. Lit Cortez grew up in Manila before leaving for the jungles of Wall Street and then Hong Kong 30 years ago. Photography is a lifelong vocation and he has spent over 25 years exploring and researching new destinations for A to A's clients around Africa, South America, and the Antarctic. He will take you through his personal photographic journey through some of the most otherworldly, sometimes harsh, but achingly beautiful corners of our planet. He will also share some tips that will hopefully inspire you to begin photographing, photographing wild places locally and further afield in the process creating awareness to preserve these vanishing areas. Lit is currently based in Cape Town with his wife Kitty and their hounds Bella and Luca. So Lit, turn over to you. Yeah, thanks, um, I'm being a, you know, thanks everyone. I see, I was chatting to Bobby, I see Princess here seeing some familiar names and, and faces and yeah, I guess like A to A clients. Yeah, so just wanted to. I was chatting to Bambina about doing doing a little photo session, and and I thought, you know, I've been doing this. I mean, on Zoom since since uh, COVID last year, and you know, and I just found that the best way to uh, yeah, kind of share some photo tips is just to go through some pictures, and um, and I I got the selection now, and we'll go through some faster, some slower, but yeah, these are just images of you know what I think, yeah, images of beauty, I guess. Which hopefully will you know put you in you know get you a bit re more relaxed and and yeah take off your shoes just I know you're all at home and I'm in shorts now you know it's morning here so uh, yeah let me just uh, try and share my screen now and then let's see uh, does everyone uh, see this now yeah definitely. yeah yeah so uh, yeah so just to start. You know, I think a few of you, I know Bobby and Princess or here, I've been to the, the okay, we live in Cape Town, but you know, the Okavango Delta is uh, really my second home uh, in Africa. I've been going there for 25 years and, and you know, for, for someone who always uh, asks about it, where, where is the best safari? I mean, I, I think it's in the Okavango just because, um, yeah, it's one of these, uh, it's a very dynamic place, you know, it gets flooded six months of the year and then the floods come from, you know, two countries away up in, up in Angola. So this is a, this is a, you know, your quintessential Okavango sunset. And I mean, just on photography, we're, we've all kind of seen sunsets and you get great sunsets in Manila. Yeah, you, I, I, the, your camera, I just always tell people, you know, whether it's your iPhone or your camera, just point it to, um, if you point it to just, you know, the spot next to the sun, then you should, you should actually get a, a pretty decent rendering on, you know, your meter, you know, your, your meter will read, read your, your, um, your scene properly. Um, and then this is just, you know, uh, Bambina said we live in Cape Town, so I just took this photo, um, I guess a couple of weeks ago, and yeah, we're, we're we're very fortunate, you know, to be quote unquote stuck here during the pandemic, just because you know it's you know it's for me it's probably the most beautiful city in the world. And that's why we live here. I've been uh, in in Cape Town and and the wine lands here now for eleven years. Uh, then people always ask about what's your last 
you know, kind of proper trip. You know, this is, uh, this is my wife, Kitty, and um, one of our dogs, his name is Luca, the chocolate lab. Uh, and this is in, in this place called the Karoo, which you know, is in the interior of South Africa. You know, tourists don't typically come here when they come to Cape Town. It's like a three to five hour drive, depending on where, um, which part you're going. But this is like our, um, you know, it's like, uh, it's our Australian outback here. Very old, very old landscape, like 300 million years old. It used to be a, an inland basin. So amazing geology if you're, um, if you're into that. And that tree, you know, it's called, uh, even in, you know, going to photography, you know, I mean, people come, come here, whether it's Africa or to South America to look at animals and, uh, you know, uh, birds. But I mean, I think the more you come, you know, you just fall in love with trees. And, and this is, uh, it's called a quiver tree. Uh, this thing is probably, it's like a massive succulent, like a giant succulent, uh, probably 150 years old. And yeah, it's just um, very, um, very iconic. And this is just, you know, I mean, the last, uh, I know people who have been by friends, friends uh, on Facebook, I've, I've been tired of seeing my, my um, bird photos, you know, during the pandemic. But yeah, I've been trying to actually probably helping a dozen people now. I have a friend in Barcelona who set up his um, his bird feeding station. So I just tell people you don't really need to um, to travel far to take, you know, if you're into photography and you want to use your camera and just, you know, practice. You know, I set up this little sunbird. You know, these are sunbirds, which are like our version of the hummingbirds in, um, in North and South America. Uh, I, yeah, set up this feeding station just like right, or maybe 10 minute, uh, 10 meter uh, feet from where I'm sitting now. And I managed to kind of habituate these guys uh, for, yeah, I, mean, I can get to maybe a foot of these guys now and photograph them. So this, this, is, a, this is an orange breast, uh, orange breasted sunbird. And you see these proteas, which um, the uh, Cape Town in the Western Cape is, is known for. Uh, yeah, and then just some more bird photos. So you um, can practice your <laughs> great practice for action photography if you're um, if you're into that. This, you know, like kind of hovering. Uh, I was planning to sell this. Uh, you know, I put some nectar into this Macallan bottle and try and you know maybe sell it to the Macallan guys at some point. And um, you see, Lindy just came in here. Um, the, yeah, and then this, you know, you what you can um, you can actually so this this it's a it's a southern double colored sunbird. It's probably as big as a matchbox, but now you can see. I mean, I used one of my my kind of long zooms for this, but you can you can see the detail. And, and you guys can do that in Manila. I was chatting to a friend who um, has a house in I think in the south in Batangas, and we were trying to set up. Right now, I mean, she just bought these feeders last last weekend. So we were trying to set up um, this nectar like nectar feeding station for um, for her. So let's see. But you, you know, I, and I was doing research for her, and you guys have pretty amazing bird life in in the Philippines. You just need to um, attract them to your garden, right? And and this is the you know, I mean, just to this is the setup. I mean, I, I uh, sir just put the bottles beside one of my cameras here in my tripod just to show you how how um you know, kind of habituated these these birds can get to your uh, to your feeding station. Um, yeah. So now let's let's go to uh, you know I, I was telling Bambina I, I I talk about South America and then or photographing places in South America and then place like Antarctica and we move to Africa in the end. Yeah, but this this place, I don't know, maybe some of you have been uh, or have heard about it. This is this is in Bolivia. Uh, it's it's called the Oyuni Salar de Oyuni or the Oyuni Salt Flats. So the biggest um, single salt flat in in the world. You know, there's a couple of big ones in Botswana. You have the ones in in the U.S. But this is eleven thousand square kilometers. So just to give you an idea, Singapore is like 720, 720 square kilometers. So this is what, like 230 Singapore's. Just of plain salt, 
um, and I think there's 12 billion tons of salt. You know, we these new electric vehicles that were um, uh, cropping all around the world. You know, this is where most of the lithium for the batteries come. And you know, this thing is it's so flat. I think the the different the altitude difference, like you know, throughout this whole 11,000 kilometers is um, really not that's less than one meter. So you cannot not visible to the eye. And and on certain months of the year, you know, from let's say February or January to April, this whole thing floods, or most of it floods, and it becomes a you know they call it a giant mirror. Like you see in this photo, it's very hard to discern where the horizon is. And and if you like your landscape photography, yeah, I mean this is probably you know one of the best places in the world to go. You just hang out there for three days and then just you know, sunrise, sunset. Um, and yeah, so this, this mirror, NASA actually uses the mirror to, um, yeah, to triangulate their, their satellites. So it's that big. If you're up in the space station, you can, you can see this big mirror. Uh, that's you need, this is a couple of shots of you. I, I always tell you, this is a, it's like a, uh, basically like a, a rubber, rubber duck slash flamingo. And you know, I tell people if you if you travel, just bring something. If you're traveling to a place which is predominantly white, just bring something co colorful so you can, you know, it just become becomes a, a good subject for photos, and just to create scale, right? Um, and this again is uh, you know my wife and then a friend slash client who uh, joined us on one, one of these trips. This is still in Uyuni, and yeah, you know, again. Try and wear. Um, in this case, you know, they they say brought some colorful scarves, and and this is another photo of that scene. But just to just to add some spice into. I mean, it's a beautiful landscape, but I think people people probably appreciate it more if you put if you put people in it. And and for you know, uh, I say now with with social media, right? We always want to be able to tell a story when we. Um, when we come back and then show our photos to uh, to friends, and this is this is the same place in in um, in Salar de Uyuni, but this is in the dry season. You know, it's a different time of the year. You can see those um, hexagons, which uh, you know, Bobby and Princess, are similar to similar, but but very different from from the Makadi Kadi in Botswana, because this um, the substrate of this uh, of the salt here, it's much thicker. I think in some parts you have maybe six meters of thick of salt so you can drive over it it's not it's not as um sensitive as the one in Botswana yeah and then these are these air streams which uh you know we're gonna use as our base for for a few days to explore um some of these areas which are just like in the middle of nowhere in the pans and then now um this is you know that that Salar de Uyuni is part of this bigger area called um the 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 South American Altiplano. You know, people ask me, okay, South America or Latin America, what's the best place for photography? You know, people usually think about Patagonia or Galapagos or the, or the Amazon. But for me, like, I, even Africa cannot beat the the scenery here. You know, the, uh, this is the the basically the Andean Plateau, uh, the biggest the biggest kind of high plateau next to Tibet. And you know Bolivia, you know, Northwest Argentina, and also Chile um, share this. So there's lots of geysers and volcanoes, and and these they call them painted mountains, as you see in the in the background. And again, you know, uh, for for landscape photography, you know, it always helps to um to put a subject. Right? You can see you can see some scale, you know, from from that vehicle in the in the picture. And this, you know, this is uh, part of the Altiplano still, you know, they, people call it the, the Salvador Dali Desert. And you've probably seen all these Dali uh, pictures or paintings, you know, on, in museums. And after this presentation, you can go back and Google it. And you see these rocks in the back and they're and kind of very identical to um, to what Dali used as his back, you know, those melting clocks and, and, and um, other surrealistic photos. Uh, 
and and I think the interesting interesting thing is that Dali had he, he never went to Bolivia in um, in his life. So people are still wondering how he yeah um, how he managed to kind of include all these backdrops in his paintings. And this is still in the in the Bolivian Altiplano. Um, still the same. This is in in the Argentine in the Altiplano, but in the Argentinian side. And you know maybe we'll I just you know thought to uh, uh, be, be a bit what well, <laughs> nerdy on on one photo here. So if you look at uh, for anyone who's into you know like science and uh, fascinating stuff. So this uh, I don't know if you see my cursor here. You know, that um, that basically blue pool. You know, there's some rocks below it. You know, these these rocks, they, they you know, they're called stromatolites. And they say they're little, little mounds of, of microorganisms. Uh, and people call them the are actually our oldest uh, known fossils. You know, history, the you know, Big Bang happened 12 billion years ago, but from 12 billion to three billion years, so that's like nine billion or eight and a half billion years, there's really no life on Earth. Nothing, you know, nothing could survive here. We were like Mars, maybe. But it's a very hostile, um, hostile planet with no oxygen. So these things, you know, these stromatolites started creating um, photosynthesis. So they're the first um, organisms which actually created uh, oxygen and, you know, paving way for all plant and animal life, right, for... For the next billion, and then for the next billion years, he just kept them producing oxygen, and you know, and and the whole the whole planet was became full of these things before. But uh, I think around a billion years ago, uh, they just disappeared, you know, mysteriously, and you um, only have them. I am I think in five or six places around the, the world now. You know, the big one is in if you go if you're you know, in Western Australia, in this place called Hamlin Bay. You know, in future you you should visit it. But this is something that um, that you find in the Altiplano as well. So it's a very um, you know very it's fascinating and and beautiful as you can see to photograph. Um, and so now going back to photo tips, right? You know, I, I, people ask, okay, how what lenses should I bring? You know, how and people travel with seven different lenses. I mean, you can you know if you're fit enough and. Uh, you know, you're, I guess you, you're happy to change um, lenses out in the field, but like this photo in, in the previous one, it's, I just probably stepped back, what, maybe 15, 20 feet. And so you don't, and people say, oh, what zoom should I bring? I mean, you can, I mean, you can walk front, back, side, you can, you know, you can duck, you can, yeah, do whatever. Yeah, find the find the 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 right angle for you, right? So like this one again, like you know, switching back between photos, you can see just by stepping back, you know, 15, 20 feet, you could be in a different place. You get more foreground here. Yeah, for landscapes, people say you know, start with the foreground so it leads to um, you know leads to the distance. But again, you know, there's really no rules. You can you can make them, break them. And this is another one. You know, this is in um, in this place called the Puna Desert, which is still part of the Altiplano. Then, like, pretty wild place. You can see the white stuff. It's actually salt. It's not snow. It's salt. And we were getting this um, yeah, this beautiful red sunset, as you see, uh, in, the, in the distance. So this I took with my, um, you know, our, our standard, I, I think it's a 24-millimeter lens, which would be... You know, your, your average uh, lens that you get in your point and shoot, like 24, 28. And you can see how, how it came out. Yeah, it's a nice picture. And then this next one is um, with my iPhone. You know, that, that, that panorama feature. You know, when people ask about, oh, it's my iPhone, you know, good enough. I mean, it is. You know, your your ca best camera is the camera you have with you, right? What, what people say. And you know your iPhones have, have you know this 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 term called dynamic range, which make, they're actually able to capture you know, um, more colors or more contrast in a, in a photo. You yeah. couldn't achieve. So yeah. can you maybe show it on your phone later, so they'll know what settings. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. This is just the you know this one. You can do your um your panorama. You know when you put it sideways and then you just like do this. You line up the arrow. At least on the iPhone. Huh? But yeah, but I can show it. Yeah. yeah, and then you'll um yeah. But you know people are especially the new one. I don't like this is this is a trip from a few years ago. This is probably just still the iPhone four. You know this is just like one of those what four generation old iPhone. Imagine the new ones and with the, with the what three cameras, what, what you can do. Yeah. Uh, so, and then this last one, this is the same, you know, the same scene. Huh? I mean, I was showing you three pictures from different lenses and iPhones, but, but when people say, you know, landscape photography or people, 99% will think I need to bring my wide, my wide angle because, you know, you, you want to take the landscape, right? Which makes sense. But you know, for me, you know, I, I always have my zoom, like this is with a 400 millimeter. You know, I have my 100 to 400 Safari lens, basically, which I brought in this trip because there's, you know, there's Pumas and, uh, and uh, Foxes in this place. And yeah, you can see with, when you zoom on something, I mean, I'll just go back again to the, the other two shots. Um, you can, yeah, this is the normal uh, from your normal lens. This is from your iPhone panorama. And this is with a zoom, but with a zoom, you can see that you actually compress um, compress the scene and even light, you know, because you're you're focusing on that orange thing. You can you can actually uh, shoot with uh, you know a, I guess like a higher aperture because you know it, it it brings in more light into your and you know if anyone wants to wants to do another session later on 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 you know, all this more technical stuff, I'm happy. Uh, but it might be you know, kind of too uh, complicated for some. But here, then this is still in that same part. Yeah, I mean, just showing you going through these photos. You can see my wife here. You know, she unfortunately has to be the. You know, it's kind of not not easy work. I think <laughs> being a being a model when we travel because you know she's had to climb this. It's it, this is a, a mound of um of salt. Huh? This is very old salt. Uh, by thousands of years old, so you can you can you can you can sink a bit, but you can also climb. So, but this photo was taken, yeah, just maybe uh, twenty minutes before the next photo. But you can see the difference. And this is from the same scene. Uh, and I usually tell people, don't you know, when you find a, a, a nice place to photograph, yeah, just be patient and just wait. You know, the sun, it's like painting. Like if, if any if you have any artists in this uh in this zoom now, you know, it's it's you have nature painting your um your backdrop for you and you just have to wait. And you know, most of the time, you know, people pack their cameras after the sun, you know, that ball goes down below the horizon. But usually, you know, at least in Africa, I can see that you're you know, it just you know, it gets a lot more interesting after that that's the, the sun goes down because you get all these different atmospheric um, things going on. Here, same thing, you know, like this is still in the Altiplano uh, where, you know, I saw like this thing glistening from afar. And this is in a, a, a lithium mine, actually. And you can see that blue, um, that blue, I don't even know what it is. You know, there was no one there. This is me, my wife, and then our, our driver. I guess this, this must be uh, i didn't want to dip my my um my, my finger in because the hospital was kind of three days away uh but yeah it's just yeah this natural beauty this is a quarry basically a mine um a lithium mine and uh like like almost five thousand feet um above sea level so it's very high then same thing still this is uh I'm gonna finish up now with the Altipa. We can move on, but this is still you know these are um, pumi stones basically, like so big, giant you know those lufas that we, you know, we all use for for spas and scrubs. Uh, and it, there was a whole field of them. Then uh, this is our our kind of guide here in red again. You know, luckily he was in red, so he you know he he could stand out to the, the photo. But but this photo I'm showing you now, you cannot. And again, elevation is you know, very important. You know, you, you you sometimes go on your stomach. Sometimes you climb the highest point in you know in the area just to get a different vantage point. But this next one is the same. I just climbed up. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's a, probably ten feet, fifteen feet feet higher. 
but you can see the you know when i show this to some friends who love landscapes you know they think that i stacked like four photos in this photo but this is just one shot you can see the the pumice stones here and then there's some uh because this is very volcanic so this 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 is lava and you have dunes and then you have a little kind of dormant volcano up there but there's lots of things going on in yeah so for landscapes just try and i mean i, I think yeah, color and texture is very um very important and uh you know if anyone is kind of a bit more technical usually what i find i shoot canon you know slrs and i i think if i shoot uh an aperture like f8 f9 f10 then that's usually the best uh if I can, if I can manage the light, then that usually gives me gives me the best um, results, right? For um, for these landscapes. Again, same same part. I just turned around. This with my iPhone. These are a bit bit close up of the pumice stone um, blocks. Uh, yeah, it could it could be like a like an outdoor museum, right? Uh, then. Next one, still uh, still in the Altiplano. This, these are, I mean, you'll see later on, I love flamingos. Uh, these are the group of, um, this, this is this high altitude lagoon called Laguna Colorada. So this red, um, red uh, substance from, from a mixture of plankton and some of the minerals up there, uh, which the flamingos love. Uh, this is a Kind of mixed mixed flock of like three kinds of flamingos. You know your Chilean flamingo, your Andean flamingo, and this uh, very rare one called the James flamingo. So when you see wildlife, when you see bird life in in big groups, you you yeah take take the group. So you can see them in their environment, but you can also take them up close. Yeah, this 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 um, particular flamingo, it's called the James flamingo, and you know, it's the most rare flamingo in the world. It only occurs up there and it uh it has the you know their filter feeders you know they have these like gummy flaps like to um to filter uh water out so they can they can feed so this this beak is the the finest beak in the flamingo world it's like you know in in now that we're all masked up right this is the the i guess the n95 uh mask of the of the flamingo world so nothing goes you know, covid will not go through that that um that beak it's so um it's so fine so we move now to um so that's that's your uh kind of altiplano and then this next one here you know when people me you know i love my wild dive and then just exploring basically when when people ask me you know if you had one day to live yeah where would you spend it and I will say I'll spend it on this island. You know, this is uh, an island in the Southern Ocean called South Georgia. Probably heard about that cool, um, pretty incredible uh, Ernest Shackleton survi survival story from yeah over a hundred years ago now, where he you know, kind of saved all his men, you know, stuck in Antarctica for over two years. So this is um, South Georgia, which uh, has all these massive, um, you know, people go to Antarctica thinking I'll see these big, big groups of penguins and you, and you, yeah, you see some big, but you, you will not see the massive groups that, that they have. And, and these king penguins, they're more sub Antarctic as well. You don't see them in Antarctica. So you need to um, you know, go to this island in, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, just to give you a, a, a perspective, right? Like, you know, before COVID, maybe what forty thousand people went to Antarctica every year. You know, all these cruises, but in South Georgia, it's probably you know maybe less than less than seven eight thousand. So this is my again iPhone. This is I took this is my first shot. I, reason why I included it, this is my first shot I took when you know you get on a zodiac, you land, and you know with my I snapped it with my iPhone, um, and and. You know, people look at it. There's you see all the penguins, but you know, there's no um, there's no rocks uh, in this in this photo. That's a, that's a pr proper pure beach, but all those brown brown blobs that you see, they're all uh, southern elephant seals. So in this um, in this bay, you know, it's called Saint Andrews Bay. There's um, I think six hundred thousand pairs of king penguins, but you can see the brown ones in the back are their babies. Yeah, so for for wildlife photography, 
I don't think anything uh, anything beats this uh, this this place. It's a bit bit of a trek to get to, but you know, it, it's definitely worth it. Again, iPhone, same thing. You probably this is this is a proper punk panorama. Uh, yeah, very old. This photo was taken what seven years ago now, so maybe iPhone three <laughs> or four, maybe very old. But you can see all these dots in the in the distance are all king penguins. So. And there's probably a million and a half penguins in this scene here. And again, showing if you look at the right side, you know, just some people maybe add add to um to just to show perspective. You know, we climbed climbed up one of these uh not glaciers, but one of these mountains or hills to get that perspective. Yeah, same as this one. This is also iPhone. Um I love using that panorama because you know I can't achieve it with my with my SLRs or maybe I need to go back and you know stitch photos to be able to achieve it with my um, my SLR. But iPhones are just or smartphones. I I, I don't have any Huawei's or Samsungs, but you know they may have even better um, better cameras than iPhones. So yeah, uh, that's still South Georgia. And here you know like these are the you know the brown. Uh, things are, are or brown penguins are the babies and they lose their you know their their down feathers as they grow and become those beautiful king penguins in the middle uh you know i'm going to show you another photo after this but you know when when people ask me about okay you know what what kind of um what what tips right for photographing animals in the wild i will say you know try to uh, you know, people, your your initial gut will be to take zooms because you want to zoom in, and, and you should. But then I think you know the, the key is to, to to show them in their um, in their natural environment because you know uh, yeah that's that's going to be proof that you didn't take it in a zoo, right? Anyone can take shots of lions, and although you know I can tell now if it's a wild or or, or zoo lion. But this, um, so, so this again, it's it's about you know how do how 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 do they live? How difficult, you know, are the are the conditions where they live? And this is one shot, and in, in, in this place, it's very you know, the the weather here is very schizo. It changes you know every ten minutes, right? But if you, this next photo was maybe like an hour later, you see what happens. Like this, it's a big blizzard it just hit us, and. And you're know, choosing between the last photo and this photo. I probably prefer this one. You know, it's not as clear because you know there's lots of snow and um, but you can see you can see, you know, when you tell your story back home, you can, you can actually show that, you know, this is how difficult the conditions were. You know, you see their backs. I ha I could only actually photograph one direction because the wind was almost horizontal. You know, it would go into my lens, <clears throat> so I had to photograph with my back. You know, uh, to the snow and but i think this photo um works better than the other one um and i just added a few photos here of like this is some of you i see lindy's here you know i think lindy's been to um to patagonia and you know, this is in the um, in the argentinian side you know people take a lot of photos of this this uh, very famous glacier called perito moreno which is one of the the, the fewest sort of advancing glaciers in in the world uh, but you know, I, again, scale. You know, there's a group of uh, guys or who are gonna gonna trek, and it just you know, without them, you probably think this is just like a you know, what's the size, right? You know, uh, I think having people or or or, or subjects in the photo will give you um give you an or your viewers an idea. And this is still in Patagonia. There's this um, place there called the. Uh, you know, this is in the Chilean side in Torres del Paine. It's called uh, the Gray Glacier. So you can, and then you know, people ask, why is it, why is it gray? You can see the. This is no Photoshop. I mean, the water is just gray, and you know that blue, um, that blue iceberg, right? So it kind of come pops out more. And you know, for again, for people who kind of are are more technical into photography, you know. The good thing about places like Patagonia and Antarctica, especially when when the clouds come in, you know, it gives you your perfect kind of gray, basically. So you don't, you know, you can put it to, you know, full auto, and it'll give you the right, give you the right exposure. Because it's like 
having a massive, uh, you know, those old gray boxes, you know, during uh, soft boxes during the, the film, film era. Same thing here, this is Antarctica now uh, with some, you know, you can see some penguins in the foreground and that, you know, when people say those, and that's an iceberg, you know, a small part of a, of a small iceberg. We can see how, how scale in Antarctica is really on another level altogether, right? And these are, um, you know, these are you know, one of those types of penguins you see in Antarctica called uh, Gen 2 penguins. And yeah, action is always you know, with, with wildlife, right? You know, whether you're in Africa or in Antarctica, you can see there's usually patterns, you know, with birds. Like this one, I could see the penguins were uh, just playing, jumping, going back up and then diving really to clean themselves because after a while they get too much penguin poo on their, on their feathers. Uh, and then just, you know, time, time the, the photo when you know, they're in midair. Yeah, that's still Antarctica, and this, you know, like this is I, I, I actually tell I, a lot of you have been to. Um, I think this guy Richard Sierra also has works in, in the states, but you know, this uh, if you've been to this Guggenheim in, in in Bilbao, you know, you can see all these oxidized, uh, uh, rusty um, metal containers. So this is you know this is in Antarctica you know, when when. You know, they actually outlawed whaling over 50 years ago now, but in the old days, they used to kill like a million whales a year down in the Southern Ocean before they were protected. And they would, you know, slaughter all those whales in the shores and then put, um, you know, put the, store the oil here until when, you know, things melted so the, sh the ships could, uh, could transport them back to Europe. Uh, yeah, so that's, you know, Antarctica is beautiful right and but it's not all but in this case you know there's a man-made structure which actually adds to the beauty and then you have again you probably notice that you know I, I always try to include subjects in the in the photo just to um create scale and spice spice things up a bit okay now we go to africa so this is um uh, you know where i live now where you know i sort of kind of travel all the time and um I always tell people this is, I mean, who have been here, you understand why Africa is special. You know, there's just that, that you know, Bambina lived here for 10 years, um, you know, that special pool. So this is in, uh, in along the, the Great Rift Valley, which, you know, people, you probably heard of it. You know, there's this big rift in, um, in, along the Africa. It actually starts up in Lebanon, you know, all the way down to, um, to Mozambique in Africa, where there's this big depression. Um, which uh, just creates a, just amazing, um, amazing landscapes and, and, and wildlife as well. So you can see um, this is uh, at the edge of, this is a old dormant volcano at the edge of this place called Lake Torcana uh, in, in Northern Kenya. And what I do, um, you know, people who know me, I, I'm kind of a bit crazy, sometimes, crazy sometimes with my aerial photography and manage to, yeah, I can have a, a network of friends now we have helicopter pilots around africa and what we do is like we just take off the doors and then we fly over all these uh you call them otherworldly landscapes right uh, and let me show you some photos here you know, this is in um in lake torcana still you know they call it the jade sea it's one of it's actually one of the most alkaline lakes in um in the world you know, we've taken, it's also uh, kind of home to some of the biggest crocodiles. So you kind of need to be careful where you take a dip. But we've you know, taken a dip here a couple of times. And it's just, yeah, you know, it's it's like going to, I try to describe it, you know, maybe my wife can better. But, you know, you go in here and then your skin is like so smooth for probably an hour. Just because of the alkali alkalinity of the water. Uh, and this is also not too far for, from where... A lot of those early um, hominid, uh, like there's this uh, old, um, they call it Torcana, Torcana man. You know, if you, if you, you know, those um, African, uh, I guess the skulls which they with which they found or bones, and then flamingos. Uh, this is you know again I I don't know why I love, I can't get um, enough of flamingos. And this is we were flying over one of these lakes in on the uh, this this lake called Lake 
Magadi, which is south of Nairobi. And, you know, I, these are young flamingos, you know, when, and they, they, they're, they're still not able to, to fly that high. And this is one of these things, you know, people ask me, it looks like a 3D, 3D picture. And yeah, they were, you know, they were just running, running and creating all these trails in the, you know, in the, in the lake, on the lake, like mud trails. And so I snapped this, uh, but you know, if you had snapped the photo, maybe 10 seconds later, this thing would be gone. Um, yeah, but it's just, you know, I'm showing you some, just uh, this, you know, what I love flying over these lakes because these flamingos, they, they move all the time and they, they create shapes. I've seen all sorts of, I, I don't know if anyone sees a bear here. Uh, I can see Noel there, Noel, can you see that bear? Um, which is, uh, you know, facing, this is the nose. But, you know, I've seen all sorts of animals, uh, you know, flying over the lakes. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, whatever, you, you go crazy, right? And this is, this is a, uh, that was a zoom earlier. So this is more, more of a, a wide angle shot of the, of the same area, just to, you know, show that you should use zoom, you use wide and um, yeah, you'll get different results. Same thing, you know, just zooming, zooming on, I'm showing you a bunch of shots of flamingos here. Like this one, you know, this is, I call, you know, I, I call this the flamingos in outer space, but this is actually uh, a shot during the day, you know, and then the white, the white little dots there are salt, because this is one of these uh, lakes in the Rift Valley, right? So I was shooting down and you can see the shadows. So it's not, they're not really in space. But yeah, again, like, you know, try to do things which will hopefully make your family and friends uh, wonder a bit when they look at uh, look at the photo, right? And see what's going on there. I think that's, then you've kind of succeeded in engaging them and, you know, asking you questions and same thing. These are, so I'm just gonna, I think I probably have a whole bunch of flamingos, just, just to give you a, a sample of, um, you know, what's, uh, you know, the beauty of, of Africa. And this, this I, I included this because this, these are, um, you can see they're different species. These are called greater flamingos. They're a lot more rare than those lesser flamingos from the previous photos. But, you know, I think I saw like a flock of maybe 10,000 flying below us um, on one, one of these uh, hairy hill missions we did. And yeah, and then same, you know, you can see uh, this is, this, it's, it's called, it's a very small seasonal lake called Lake Logipi, but you can see from, from an aerial view, right? So all the, you know, the riverbeds here from, and there are mountains behind, which, uh, which uh, I guess produce all these amazing conditions for flamingo, flamingo food. You can see groups of flamingos at the bottom there. Um, yeah, and the next one in Africa still, you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, in, in the, the DRC or the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is one of the poorest and um, poorest in terms of money, but also probably the wealthy, wealthiest country in the world in terms of minerals. You know, this is where all the cobalt, which is used for our, you know, iPhones and electric vehicles and um, all these gadgets come from. So this is a volcano. In um, in Virunga National Park, which uh, we climbed actually, and you know it's 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 one of the I think only four or five active lava lakes in um, in the world, where uh, your people can climb and you we slept on the rim for um, for one night and then I'll show you some pictures. So this is from the top. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, I tell people if you can, like you know, like Iceland now with that volcano. I'm, you know, if I if there was no COVID, I'd probably be up there, you know, trying to see see what I can photograph because it's just there's something about uh, you know photographing, you know, like how do I say it, like matter sort of formed before your eyes, you know, because that will become when it rolls down the the volcano, it'll become something, whether it's a hill or a island. Uh, so it's just so special. Yeah, again, you know, with my zoom, so I, you know, this is zooming on the on that lava lake with um, my zoom lens. You can see more detail. Same as here. So yeah, I tell people when I, you know, when I was watching this lava lake, you know, I was looking at it, and then I looked at my watch. I actually 
had been looking at it for like half an hour. I had to remind myself to take pictures because it really mesmerizes you. Just watching you know, shapes you know, changing every second and you're focusing on one shape and then it, a new vent comes up. Yeah, so it's, yeah. Yeah, again, so up on the volcano, just to, to mix it up, like show show people with um, you know, behind it. And, you know, this, I had my wife take a photo of me looking into, um, down into the volcano just to, to show, um, show scale. Um, yeah, and then this next one here, you know, this is, uh, you know, people ask me what's your favorite safari ever, you know, and I, I, I tell people, you know, it's in this place in the middle of, it's in Central Africa in this country called Chad. Chad, and uh, you probably read in the news. You know, the president just um, died uh, last week. You know, he was 68 years old, but he's still. You know, it's it, it's actually in the southern Sahara Desert, and he actually died on the battlefield. He was. Uh, you know, they were fighting rebels, and it's very sad. But yeah, yeah, this is my my last safari, proper safari, right? Which is March 2020, a year ago now. And um, and in this place, you know, there's many you know many highlights. But one is you know these uh, they call you see these birds, they, you've probably seen in the UK all these starlings. They call them murmurations. You know, they they're they're shape shifters. They just move around. But these birds, they're they're they call them quilias. You know, in 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 Africa, red billed quilias, part of the weaver family, and they're they're the most numerous. No, I think not only bird but animal in the world. And there's like 1.5 trillion of them and they always go together and and there's this place in chad called zakuma where every every you know two three months of the year they congregate because of you know climate conditions and food and seeds they're seed eaters and you can get these amazing um every day you know, sunrise sunset you can see this i just i'm just going to show you a bunch of photos of these quilia, you know, they, they fill the sky. They're like locusts, um, basically. Uh, I don't think farmers like these guys because they just, you know, nail all their seeds. Uh, and yeah, they're just like an amazing, I think that they have the shortest breeding cycle, like the incubation period is like, I think 10 days. So I think every 10 days, these guys produce new eggs and um, that's why they're so successful. We call them Africa's um, feathered locust. Uh, yeah, they fill the skies. You know, I always tell people this is, you know, this is Africa's northern lights. So you just watch, you watch these things dancing, you know, every um, every sunset. But they're uh, they're not uh, not light. You know, it's uh, it's it's birds. So everything eats them there. You can see these raptors. You know, these are a couple of hawks uh, or kites trying to um, hunt them. And here you can see uh, there's a little lion cub, which is uh, you know it'll go. It's but the lion cub will catch maybe you know catch a couple it's like us having you know a couple of m&ms m&ms maybe right uh not worth the you know not, uh, the energy expenditure for lions but they try and go for it and, they, and here's a close-up you know uh, of, of those birds that's why they call they're beautiful birds but there's just so many of them you know they call them uh red-billed quill and again here you know on, in terms of action photography you sir sir you know you shoot use, using your shutter speed mode and for birds, I find like it's like one over twenty five hundred, you know, shutter speed. Then you can you can freeze, uh, you know, freeze them in flight. For smaller birds, and if the, if it's bigger birds, maybe. And again, it's trial and error. You know, you you just play around. You know, it'll be blurred. Then take another shot, faster shutter speed. If it, if you're losing light, then see if you can work with the lower shutter speed. Uh, but again, we can do action photography if anyone is interested you know, to do another one. Uh, so we're uh, kind of running out of time, but I'm good. And then this is Ethiopia. I was chatting to, um, uh, chatting to Bambina and Bobby before uh, some of the others joined. But in Ethiopia, you know, Ethiopia is, you know, if you ask me, yeah, you know, what's my favorite kind of all around, you know, for photography, right? Because you can photograph landscapes and animals and, and people. You know, uh, nothing beats Ethiopia. You know, there's this place called the Omo Valley in in the south, where there's there's seventeen or eighteen tribes. You know, you know the the lip plate ones, the ones with um, the bull jumpers. So there's it, it's just so fascinating. Um, and this this particular tribe I'm showing here, just for photography purposes, they're called the uh, 
the Kara tribe or Karo, Karo or Kara. You know, they're they're very very famous body painters and face painters. And I think there's only a thousand of them, a thousand of them left uh, remaining. So their culture is vanishing, among these vanishing tribes. So we spent three days with them in and this is in 2018. Um, and I actually only got to photograph them on the third day because you know it's very you know you can't just go in there guns blazing and you know and you can see a lot of them have AK-47s. So you, um so I mean it's it's not like uh America where you know there's there's mass shootings all the time, but they yeah, they're they're pretty tough people and and you need to respect their culture, but and then you know, kind of learn about so the first day we were just chatting to them and then and they'll allow you to take photos later. But this is a photo of them, you know, they, they had a, a, it just, you see the clouds behind, so they're gonna have a rain, um, and a rain harvest dance. So luckily, you know, you're, we were um, we were the only foreigners here, I think there's like probably a, a thousand of them, um, it's pretty special. And, and and this next photo is just angles, you know, this this is a photo of the same guys, but from the other side, Really the sun was going down and and I just thought that you know this you know one of them slung his uh, AK40 AK on the you know on the pole and you know, just adds adds sort of kind of adds to the story right you can see that there it, it, this and they have you know these, these these things work you know they have bullets you've seen seen in a couple of guys but it's more of a uh, kind of status symbol than than a weapon for them right just to show that you you know yeah you're wealthy enough, then you have a, a, you know, a semi-automatic rifle. So here, uh, you, know, you can close up on uh, close up on their, you know, for people, right? You know, I try to, yeah, you can take portraits of faces, but I also try to take, you know, body parts. In this case, you can see the the intricacy in their um in their body paint and the bullets, you know, probably made in China. Because uh, they can't afford the uh, you know the, the Western ones, and this is a little kid who was um, you know watching from afar, and you know I think he, he was yeah you know, maybe I guess maybe five years old this kid, and he was still not of course not the warrior, uh, but then I, you know him and his friends they were already trying to practice. You can see at a young age, practicing with their uh, with their face paint, and I thought it's pretty um, pretty cute, and he allowed me to take a photo. And Ethiopia again, still, you know, people. This is uh, I just you know, show you a couple of photos of you know the churches in Lalibela. Uh, if you like your um, your people photography, this is just you know again just so so spectacular. There's no tourists here. Uh, these churches are what maybe fourteen hundred years old, but and they still use it as they you know it's like us going to you know your church in Makati or in Alabang uh, and everyone is always in white um so it's great for you know, the, the contrast is great for photography and even this um this picture i was uh, showing it to a friend and you know and this is just what maybe four years ago uh but you, you know you could actually this scene could have been you know two thousand years ago which still uh you know uh, you know, one of these um deacons actually managed to smuggle us into one of the masses and i just took a small camera you can see the natural light coming in from that that cross uh kind of window in the, the back um and this is the famous um they call it Pete, so it's saint george basically in in english that, that famous uh underground uh, underground church that i think people have kind of you know people see all the time whether maybe sort of all the worshipers and another angle of that church is, uh, yeah, and just you know, again showing perspective. I climbed up, you know, kind of a little hill in the back there, and then now it's kind of more eye level with these uh, with these worshippers. And you know, this this thing, you know, this is not it's not paint. Huh? So these are all because they're old, and this is they call it living rock. So this thing is still connected to the ground. So it's it's a it's a live it's a living thing. So these are all lichen, you know, these little fungus uh, growing um, growing on the on the rock beautiful like if you if you go in the sunset it'll be pink or orange and um, yeah so maybe Ethiopia so this is still Ethiopia this is 
is the last part you know, the, um, called the Dana Kale Depression. If you like your scenery again, you know, it, it, it's, it's very, very um, hot here. Hottest place in the world, but you know, most beautiful, right? It's, uh, so we flew, this is, we had a helicopter again, you know, helicopter thing. We went up and um, tried to take some aerials. Here you can see uh, the shadow for chopper here. But I don't even know what, you know, it's just so hot to, to go down there. We couldn't, we couldn't land. And so it's just uh, very inhospit inhospitable environment. And, the, and this is this place called Dalol in, in Danakil still, where you have all these sulfur ponds. And you, if you dip your toe in there, you melt. But you can see the colors, right? And again, the, the, you know, there's, for me, I find that the more hostile or inhospitable an environment is, like, the more beautiful. It could be more windy, very windy or very hot or very cold or very high in altitude. But then I think that's how, um, you know, the way probably God and nature um, you know, kind of place these things, right? You can see these are, these are um, we needed bodyguards to go there because it is at the border of, um, of Eritrea and there was, you know, they had a ceasefire. But yeah, and to show scale, you can see um, this uh, this guy, he's like from this, they call it the Afar tribe. You know, this is like 50 degrees. I mean, I, I probably drank maybe seven, you know, one of those seven small bottles of water in like half an hour, but this guy didn't even, he's adapted, you know, he didn't even drink. I offered him water, but you know, he said it is winter time there. So that we went during their winter. Uh, yep, and this is still like the last one in Danakil. You can, you probably notice, I love my, you know, getting photos of these whatever, like things under the ground. Uh, this is a salt pool in, uh, in the Donakil. And now we go to wild dive. I think we're already at 10, but you know, I think I just have a, some photos of wild dive here. Um, gorillas, right? You, uh, maybe some of you have been to um, either um, Rwanda or Uganda for mountain gorillas or the Congo. And um, yeah, I just find them just so fascinating. You know, like they're they're one of our closest uh, relatives, right? And they split from us eight million years ago, and we still share ninety eight per ninety eight point three percent DNA with them. Uh, there's a thousand of them left now. Um, you probably heard of them, you know, from Diane Fossey and her Gorillas in the Mist, uh, you know, movie and book. And when she, you know, she was murdered, actually. She died in nine, the late 70s or early 80s. And when, when she passed, you know, there were, I think, just 250 mountain gorillas left. But because of tourism and, and conservation, I think last two years ago, they, they crossed 1,000 again for the first time. And, and it's so special seeing these guys. You know, you, and there's, this one is from the Congo, you know, um, this, his name is Baseka. I'll never forget his name. He was part of this group, which they had four silverbacks. And, you know, for, um, for photos, uh, for wildlife photos, I always tell people, try to get, try to be eye level with them. You know, when you take a photo of an animal, it's just more flattering if your background is not the, the ground. If your back, backdrop is the sky, then, you know, you get the better. Like, it's like people, it's like someone photographing you from a ladder looking down on you then you know maybe us the people will say it's not oh, don't use that because it's not going to be my most flattering photo same as animals you know, try to shoot you know whether you're in a vehicle or walking just go go as low as you can and then you don't have to do it all the time you can mix it up but you can see this you know i actually went on my on my tummy photographing this silverback and he actually did the same thing and we had a little kind of moment stare off for 10 minutes I was just, I took lots of photos of him and then, yeah, and then you look into his eyes and look, looks into you and then you get this, this connection. You can see, hey, these guys are, are really our, um, our cousins, right? So we need to, uh, we need to protect them. And you can see again with, uh, this is a gorilla foot. And when people say how, you know, how close they are to us, uh, you know, it probably needs a bit of a pedicure there, but you can see, you know, it's an opposable, opposable toe or thumb, uh, but you can see the how si the similarity to humans, right? And again, this is uh, this is a, a gorilla hand, uh, so you can see the knuckles. Uh, 
um, a lot hairier than, than most of us, but and you can see how um, wide our relatives are. Um, okay, now wildlife. Uh, this is not, you know, people always uh, you know, talk about the great migration, which is those wildebeest up in East Africa, and they're amazing to see, but this one is down in, um, in Zambia, and these are Cape Buffalo. You know, uh, you know, people talk about, uh, you know, which, which prey is the hardest for lions to, um, to take down. And this is, you know, I think growing up in the Philippines, you know, we've had a lot of our carabaos. And I also, you know, first time I saw these guys, I, I said, you know, oh, they're just like, you know, those kalabao in, in the Philippines. But they're, they're, these, they're a lot more, a lot more um, when you see them, they're a lot more uh, badass than, uh, than our carabaos. So, you know, I think they, they actually um, injure more, um, a lot more people than, than lions in, uh, in Africa because they're just, they're mean. You know, they're very mean animals. Uh, and then to see them, I think we saw a herd of, this is a, a little segment, but we saw a herd of probably 2,000 on this day. Again, from a, this is from a helicopter. So getting that angle from above. And, you know, zebras, or I think zebras for, um, for, for the Philippines. Uh, this is in, the, in this place called Ongoro, Ongoro Crater in Tanzania. So seeing animals from you know in in you know, in, in numbers is always great for photography, you know it, it shows that you 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 know, you kind of were really out in the wilderness and then this is you know looking at this now you can see why um, you know a group of a group of zebra they call them a dazzle of zebra or a kaleidoscope of zebra because I think those stripes um, confuse uh, confuse predators as well. Uh, Giraffes, everyone loves giraffes. And then, you know, this is in Tanzania as well, in the south. And then you can see, uh, you know, world's tallest animal. And then, you know, you have an iconic baobab tree, uh, you know, which is everyone's favorite tree after you go in safari. Then giraffes, same thing, you know, like I was talking about shooting, uh, you know, shooting eye level or shoot in sunsets. Like, you know, what I tell people when you're, Tell your safari guide when this maybe, you know, maybe half an hour before you think the sun's going to start to drop. Try to look for either giraffes or elephants because you know they're they're amazing to silhouette. If you see a lion, it's just going to be impossible to silhouette because you can't really go in your tummy and um, and photograph it. But you know these taller animals, they're they're great for silhouettes uh, for sunset. Again, this this is also in Chad. Uh, you know. See these the giraffes are they're the, one of the most underappreciated animals. You know, you see lots of conservation um, PR for elephants and rhinos, but you know uh, these these things are also uh, very very vulnerable. Again, this is you know the, the same. Uh, this is not with my iPhone. I think I just cropped this, but uh, yeah, again showing showing groups of animals are always so when you thought you know sometimes like you see if you see the scene then maybe you're going to say i'm going to choose a giraffe here and focus on its face or its body but then try to um you know try to photograph them as a group right that's always helpful um and then this next one is lions you know from thing with people who've been in safari you know it's it's true that lions actually sleep um 18 hours a day so chances are when you see a lion, it's going to be boring, doing nothing. Maybe they just ate. Uh, but this one is, yeah, I mean, we saw them on, you know, we had the helicopter in the camp and then we saw them on a, on a kill and then we said, let's fly over them to get a different angle. So it's all angles. So try, try to take uh, whether it's high, low of, um, of uh, wild animals, right? Again, here, um, I don't know what you see. You can see this is in Botswana. Yeah, you, you probably can see um, there are two leopards in this picture. Uh, so the mother is here on the left. And then this is the, the, the daughter. Again, showing, um, you know, I could have taken a zoom of these leopards, but I think if you show them, it shows scale as well of how big that tree is. And, you know, they're looking out and trying to, um, you know, eye, eye a group of antelope in the distance. And that same same cub, you know, a few minutes later went down and 
you know, try to try to climb one of these little bushes, which which is to I think it even broke broke a bush. Uh, but you know, everyone likes their big cats, right? So that's that same leopard again, which you know, a few minutes later went into a termite mound because it was tired and then just stared at us and allowed us to take a a, a different photo, a, a kind of unique photo, right? And close up, you know, you can close up on this is a different leopard, but and people say, you know, when you know, I wanted to include this photo because people say when you photograph an animal, you know, focus on its uh, on its eyes, you know, because that's you want to make the eye sharp. But in this photo, I was so close to it that, uh, you know, the ones if I, I focus on the eyes, I mean, it wasn't as nice as focusing on the actually I had to focus on the bridge of the nose to make to make it work because it is just so close. But yeah, as a general rule, you probably notice, you know, I think they say if you have a you want to take a portrait of an animal, focus on make sure the eyes are sharp because that draws the, the viewer. Again, this is a you know beautiful leopard. Then you know it's I yeah, it's probably one of my favorite cats because they're just yeah, you know, kind of harder to find and then they're they're sneaky and there's something you know, something different about them. And this next one here, you know, you when I ask people like what 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 this is you know this is this is actually a jaguar this is in south america and people ask what the difference between jaguars and leopards are you can see this so this is not new photography but really more animal uh, wildlife you know identification right? but this is you can see a jaguar here it's like a much bigger much bigger cat than a leopard but you can see the rosettes you can see they call these things rosettes the black spots with um in, in a jaguar's case, you have a black dot in the middle. I'm going to go back to this leopard here. If you look at this leopard, you can see their, their rosettes are just plain in the middle. If someone shows you a photo of you know, a spotted cat next time, then you, um, you can easily distinguish a, a leopard and a jaguar. Right? This is in the Pantanal in, um, in Brazil, which is the Okavango Delta of, um, of South America. Um, elephants, you know, so we're, we're finishing now. So in elephants, you know, same thing, you know, lots of people, I, we, we um, go to this uh, camp in Botswana, or this is in Botswana, which is actually the, has the biggest population of elephants in Africa or in the world. And, you know, there's this underground hide where you, you know, they, they sunk a, basically a, con a shipping container underground and, you know, beside the water hole. And you could take all these amazing angles of like this. You can see I actually stuck out my camera and used like that elephant close to me as a frame. So you can mix up your um, photo angles and uh, yeah, get some get just some fun uh, fun results. Same thing here. You know, you have this hyena which kind of walked into walked into um, the frame. Yeah, use uh, use use whether it's animals or trees or uh, yeah, something the foreground is to make, uh, you know, because we, we usually just take these static photos of animals as, you know, standing there. Yeah, which is nice, but uh, I think these things like this just uh, allow you to mix up your, your, your photography portfolio. Same thing here, you know, that same elephant, you know, try to yeah, just play, you know, with digital, it's great, right? You just take, take shots and you can delete, you can, you can position animals, uh, you know uh in, in in little frames that you make and and this one same this is in zimbabwe you know this is the only place in africa where elephants have learned to it's like they're like circus elephants they're wild huh? but they've learned to um to stand on their uh and you need special muscles to develop special muscles to stand on your hind legs what they do a certain time of the year they'll pick up this uh it's it, it, it's not it used to be called acacias but yeah they're these pods basically I'll be the pods, which are like Oreos, you know, for elephants. So after they uh, they finish all the low stuff, uh, stuff in the low branches, they'll they'll go up and um, and, and they uh, try to reach as high as they can. And, and again, framing it with uh, you know with trees adds to the to the scenery. And now we and then this is you know this is actually my my. Not a selfie, but by self photo with my wife here. I just put a, you know, maybe had someone take this for us. I put it in a tripod. But this is a, you know, we all love um, 
or baobabs, right? Which you know, people have been to. Um, yeah, you have them in Botswana and, and, and there's some places in Tanzania and in Zimbabwe where you get you know, amazing groves of these baobabs. You know, some of them, they've been carbon dated to um, 3,000 years old. And uh, lots of legends and stories. You probably you know, remember them from, uh, from The Little Prince where uh, you know, he planted a baobab on, 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 on these little planets. Um, so, and then you know, there's one baobab species in continent, continental Africa, there's one in Australia, but you know, Madagascar actually has seven, um, seven species. So if someone loves your baobabs, you know, Madagascar is your place. Right? You'll see different, uh, different shapes and sizes. And yeah, and then ending now, you know, this is a baobab still, you know, um, and then I just wanted to end with uh, with some, you know, people ask me, uh, you know, now with uh, uh, night photography or what do you call it, astrophotography. Uh, in this case, you know, people are saying, well, how, how did you kind of manage to get a sunset with a baobab, with the stars? But this is really, you know, this, the, the orange you see in the background is like a distant for this is in Botswana a distant um, forest fire, which was not even visible to, to my, the naked eye when I took this photo, because you actually have to have your shutter open for, um, for 30 seconds. And the orange just came out and it worked. Same thing here, you know, this is in, in the salt pans again, you know, if you like playing around with your shadows, and this, this is an, one of those accidental photos where you know, our driver just, you know, he was moving the vehicle and I was taking my photo and, you know, behind me. And you can see, I always tell this is probably the longest shadow I've ever had. Yeah, it never ends. Uh, and then it is also one of those very starry nights. Yeah, and then I just wanted to, you know, show you some, you know, people usually ask, right, you know, am I, to take these photos, am I going to have to uh, torture myself or slum it and, uh, I think Bobby, you'll remember, um, and Princess, remember this. This is Sand Camp in Botswana in the Makadi Gadi. So you uh, you can actually, yeah, have a lux luxurious time while while taking uh, great photos, right? Uh, yeah, this is also in the in the salt pans, and yeah, I mean. So I think I was counting here. I think I got like three shooting stars into the frame, you know, in, in 30 seconds. So you can just play around and uh, you know and and see what, what comes out. Same thing, this is also another, you know, this is actually in, in Lake Tanganyika in Tanzania. And you know, when when you're shooting, and this is the Milky Way, when you're shooting uh, night photography, right? I, I usually find you know people will send me photos and say, well, "What do you think of this?" And it's it's amazing, you know, very clear Milky Ways and stuff. But but you know, there's no subject again. You know, imagine if you didn't have this subject, then it'll just be sky, which will be yeah interesting to look at. But I think having a you know having a subject with a sky, so always include you know, include the horizon and below when you, um, when you take night photos. Um, and this one, this is, you know, a bit more technical, you know, I, I wanted to take the Milky, the whole Milky Way curve. So this, I actually had to take, I think 12 shots. This is in Bolivia, uh, 12 shots. And I just had to stitch them back home, you know. Uh, Photoshop has this really cool command. It's just called merge. You just merge, your, you select 12 photos, it'll merge it. As long as you um, you know you you take them properly, so take them you know because this is the Milky Way that you will never see with your naked eye as a as a curve because it's just so um, it's so vast right our sky. Yeah, and then the last one here. This is you know like people like to, people like to light paint. I always um, you know uh, you just get a you get a torch or a flashlight. And you play around, and like here, I spelled eight away, which is my, my car company, and um, yeah, and it's fun. You know, you can spell your names, you can spell your family's names, and just have fun. And, and it's all trial and error, but uh, yeah, because for, I think you you need to make photography fun as well, right? When you're, otherwise, it's just you know, if, if it's too serious, uh, you know, like when we when when we I take some clients, we never you know. It's never super. We we will have half the time you're having fun, you know, learning and uh, no, there's no right or wrong, right? 
so that's um that's it guys that's uh i don't know if anyone has questions or bambina i don't know what you uh let me just see if i can let i guess you can do this with an iphone most of these um most of these shots like when you no, said no, you no. close to the leopard how, or even the the ape how uh the gorilla how close were you um Pretty close, yeah. The gorilla very close. You know, you can maybe the rule is I think uh, seven feet. You know, you if they you need to keep that more so you you don't you don't give them germs and um and and any viruses. But but some of them you know they'll yeah you know, the little ones they're gonna you know play with you. Probably gonna try and take your shoe off. Uh, no, it's fun. Um, but yeah, but the gorillas are safe. You know, gorillas are they never you know chimpanzees are a bit more tricky. You know, they can be violent, but gorillas are peace loving. I don't think there's even been any rec record re uh, recorded gorilla attack. Um, so they're 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 pretty chilled out. But lions, of course, the big cats are. You know, you cannot. You need to zoom for those guys. How do you optimize the iPhone? I don't know if if everybody other people have this question as well because I'm useless. So I. Yeah, I know it's no idea how to optimize the iphone to to make really good like really dramatic pictures like you do yeah i know what you do you need to have um you know there's this term in photography called metering right so your camera is programmed to to take you know, to to read your scene and uh take a photo but then you most of the time you know when it's too bright too dark you know, there's too many different shades going on in um, in in the scene. Then it confuses your camera or your iPhone. So you just need to be able to um, to meter. Uh, yeah, you just point, and then you know. I don't know if you have an iPhone, and when you when you point it to your scene, you just you can see you can see with your eyes. The good thing about iPhones is you can see whether it's too bright, too dark. Then yeah. there's this thing there that's uh, that's. You know, if you put your hand on the on the screen, there's the, the sun, the sun kind of icon comes out. Mm -hmm. and you just drag it up or down. You can drag it up or down. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because people usually um and you know it's also, you know, it's one of these, it's like having your, you know, you 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 kind of got once you get used to your equipment, you you I don't know, it's one of these things. You'll know. You kind of know you you'll know, but you just need to use it a lot. Huh? Then yeah. you'll know how how these will behave and then oh. Uh, then you can you can anticipate and you can yeah a lot with trial and error as well but, um, julie boski has a question what are yeah. your preferred lenses to bring around or preferred camera as well she's looking into the canon m50 yeah okay. you know hi julie you know what i you know, i'm still old school you know i don't i just i'm just one of those i still use my my slrs right you know those the, the kind of big loud ones were there's something where you know, if I you know, I think that M all the new M series of Canon they're all mirror they call it mirrorless. You don't really have that shutter. Yeah, for me, I don't know why. I I think it's I'm 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 gonna switch at some point. I'm probably looking at Sony, but uh, people are have been have been recommending Sony. Yeah? There's like the Sony. If you want, um, if you if you don't have Canon equipment anyway now. I, I think I would, if I were you, I would try to. There's like a Sony A7. I think it's A A7 IV. There's an A9, which may be a bit too, um, a bit too, uh, what's this, uh, overkill. Uh, I think just use the A7. And then the lenses, you know, uh, depends. If you want to shoot, um, what's like landscapes, you need the wide angle, right? Like something that starts maybe with 16, 17 millimeter. Then the zoom. You know, I think anything anything longer than 400, I think, is overkill for Africa because you can get close to... I mean, if you're shooting birds, I mean, you know, there's some, some of those tiny birds, then you need a bigger one. But you know, there's very few. I, I, I want to do... It's, it's a, probably a waste of money and also uh, one of those things that only... It's so, so specialized, right? But you're talking about S SLR cameras, am I right? Yes, yeah, or, or even the mirrorless, it's the same. Huh? Yeah, if you know, because you can even use your old SLR lenses and just put adapters for your um for your mirrorless. Sony uh, also makes these cameras, or they always did. Which no, they only start. Yeah, the Nikon are usually like they're most, you know, they're the most well known. Yeah, exactly. Right. 
Yeah, yeah. Canon and, and Nikon are, are, have been uh, for wildlife the the sort of kind of gold standard. Then you could be either. And you know, lots of my friends and clients half are Canon, half are Nikon. And because a lot of them started photographing during the film days, you know, and it's a hassle naman to okay, I'm gonna switch to, to Nikon or Canon. But you know, the Sony now, you know, I'm really tempted. I think it's you know, I have to admit now, I think it's better than. Uh, their technology is, I think, better now than Canon in Nikon. When you travel, you don't check those in. Just, just going into the practicalities. You, 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 no. you carry the lenses. You have a camera yes. bag, I guess. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have a backpack, and then um, you know, over time, I I used to bring very big lenses, like the one I showed earlier. I never bring those big ones anymore. Uh, and yeah, I just bring uh, you know, I. I don't bring that many clothes when I, when I travel because your your allocation is like nice all, all for, for okay. equipment. Can you bring a tripod yeah. with you and a selfie stick? Do you use those as well? And not a selfie stick. Um, no, a tripod I bring. Uh, definitely bring. You need it for um for night photography. Uh, but other than that, you know, for wild dive, like a big a tripod. You know, a lot of clients ask when I'm on safari, do I bring a tripod or a monopod you know it's actually very hard because anim you know, animals are running and birds are flying all the time you know tripods are are not as useful and you can handhold you know what i what i usually suggest is you know you can and we for our clients we actually request if you're a photographer before you go we're going to request the camps to they call them bean bags basically just sacks with with sand in them or um salt or sugar and uh yeah so then you just rest your your camera on the on the on the bean bag you know on the on the vehicles um you know there's lots of bars in, in these safari vehicles and yeah. then you also mentioned about taking photos overhead so was that with yes. a drone or you were the helicopter are those easy to arrange when you're on safari for example? yeah 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 very easy yes you know it, it places like you know the 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 It'll be very difficult to arrange them in places like Ethiopia and Chad and some of the more off the beat. But but you know in Botswana, in Kenya, South Africa, it's pretty easy. Uh, the the helicopters. I mean drones. You know, unfortunately, and and actually for me it's good because I think they, the most of the parks don't allow them here, because mm -hmm. you know for security purposes. Um, so so helicopters are good. You know you can. Uh, it's just fun, you know. You're you take off the doors, and, and you, you'll find that those choppers are so stable. It's not, you know, if you even if you're afraid of some people are afraid of heights or flying, but you know, and it's it's once you do it once, it, it can be. In fact, in Botswana now, what we do when you transfer from Camp A to Camp B, we just transfer you in a chopper. Oh, because okay. You, um, yeah, yeah, you can uh, you can do some photography on the way. I have a question here from Noel. You took yeah. photos in the helicopters. Was it? Did you have to use a tripod as well in the helicopter, or just handheld? No, okay. just handheld. Just handheld. Yeah, yeah. Because with with the helicopter, you know, and even with planes, you know, with those small planes, if you, because we take off the doors sometimes with those small Cessnas, you know, you have to. Uh, the moment you stick out your your, you know, there's that that little uh, imaginary barrier you know, or not a wall, but yeah. there's a you cannot stick out your your equipment um you know like an inch it's gonna get blown away yeah? mm -hmm. so you have to uh yeah but yeah you get used to it and you know you fly the uh, doors are taken out yes but you're flying low right you don't fly very high yes but you know, sometimes you can tell the and then these pilots you know they're 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 like safari guides uh, they're they're photographers as well so they they know how to you know because the sun angle is important the mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and the good thing about choppers is they can, you know, they can hover. The thing with those, uh, with those small planes, you know, they cannot. You always have to be moving forward. So, I do it. I do it quite a lot as well. But you know, that, in fact, I, I kind of find it, um, I don't know, more challenging because you're, you have to, you know, you're fly. You look forward, and then you're going to see something that you want to photograph, a scene. And then you know that it's going to be in your view in the next ten seconds, and then you have to snap. Then you know. Then after two seconds, it's gone. 
Yeah. So, but I just find it's part of the, but you know, choppers are much easier because you can, the pilot will just hover above the scene and then you can just take as many photos and then, the, you know, they'll spin it a bit if you want to, you know, backlit, frontlit, sidelit. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. Yeah. It's very, it's it's not cheap. It's a very ex expensive, um, what's this like, be sure, oh. how, how you right? Yeah. 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 But yeah, rewarding, I think, quite rewarding as yeah. well. Especially yeah, yeah, exactly. Beautiful photos like these. Just yeah, no, I love it. Yeah, because you know, like when you were in a chopper, because you just, you know, you have an hour and then you're just taking the, you have no idea. You cannot look at your, you have no time to look at your view, you know, your your LCD to see yeah. if it's good or bad. You just keep on taking and then when you get back to camp, yeah, then you just, it. okay, wow, there's some, oh, I didn't even realize I saw this scene. And then, you know, it, 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 it comes up in your, uh, in your card. And yeah. But usually, do you see that, do you see the animals? It's like, like if you're looking at, let's say, all the flamingo, and then all of a sudden you see, I don't know, like when after you see the photos, and then you realize, oh, there was a, a leopard or, you know, or some other animal or a, a buffalo that you didn't see, you know, when you were taking the pictures, you only realized after. Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, 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 I did into, but yeah, I've taken like, you know, like shots of like some rare stuff, like serval which is like this very rare spotted yeah. cat you know, even like I, I when we were in northern kenya a few years ago like striped hyena which i've never seen a striped hyena on the ground uh because i guess some you know maybe they're they're, they're very skittish on the ground but you, because you're flying um yeah. no no yeah i've seen like like lion leopard cheetah uh from the air I, or, or they um, just appear in the photo wild dogs. when you look back at the photo you don't realize that there was that animal yes. hiding all, all the time within. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes you're taking a photo of one lion. Then you think, okay, this is the lion, the male lion. Then when the photo comes out, you didn't see, oh, there's like yeah. kind of four lions on the side, which you didn't even see when you, um, you know, when you, when you snap that picture, right? But that's that, that whole, you know, like, yeah, part, you know, it, it's just like on safari. When, you're, when, when you go out on a drive, you have no idea what you're going to see today. As you know, Bambina, right? Yeah, you know, you yeah, can, exactly, yeah. You no know, two whatever walks or drives or boat safaris are the same because uh, yeah, that's why it keeps us all, you know, yeah. yeah, on our, uh, on our toes. Um, Bobby and, has a question. When is the best month to visit Ethiopia? Yeah, good question, Bobby. You know, um, it, the, the season of Ethiopia is kind of balikta, you know, the opposite of the your, your um, normal safari. So, now it, it, it's already going to start raining. So it's it's actually from yeah maybe November to November. And then until now, yeah, now is typically the end of the, the end of the, um, the season. And then Bobby, you know, the, the thing there, if you like, um, what's this like people or culture or people photography, you know, the, the, the festivals are amazing. You know, we, we should time it with what, you know, there's probably a dozen festivals there, which, you know, you, you'll it, they're mind blowing, right? So you can, but but unfortunately, the you have to. They're not all in the same month. You know, they happen all throughout the year. We just choose, and then we'll. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, such a great great destination for me. Yeah, you know, that's just you know, uh, the religion. They're probably the most the most devout people in the world. Huh? Early Christians, right? One of the early earliest Christian churches. I think if yeah, I'm yeah, they're yeah, they're more they're uh, you know they're they're um, Orthodox Christians, and yeah. uh, uh, in fact, in this place, and you probably read about the news. Unfortunately, they've had a civil war recently in this uh, in one of the the states, right? Yeah. This place called mm -hmm. Gray. So this the uh, not the capital, but one of the big cities cities in Tigray called Aksum. That's where you have allegedly the Ark of the Covenant is there. So people, um, people, you, you cannot see the ark, but you can see the the, the, the church where it is, and um, yeah. Um, anyone with more questions? I think we're okay. No more questions, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank it's you. A pleasure to thank have you. you. Yes, if you want to actually ask Lit maybe more technical questions, just. You can course it through me, through Manila House, and we'll be happy to put you guys in touch. And of course, if you're considering a safari or, or a trip to South Africa or Africa, Antarctica, or South America, you know who to call. 
um, they're the specialists in, in those areas um, with how many years now, Lip? Several years of experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in people. 2002. So yeah, so 19 years now. Yeah, but you know, in the photography front, if anyone, guys, you know, you can see, I just, I enjoy just showing pictures and chatting. It's it's something I like. So if anyone wants to, I, I do it all the time, you know, with clients. It could be just like Bobby, just one-on-one -on -one, you know, or your family or, Thank you. yeah, I mean, and then whatever, you know, any, any, I think the, the only what thing that I probably don't have experience is all the, you know, these, they call it street photography, which, you know, yeah. photographing in cities, but yeah, yeah. But, you know, but some of the, but if it's wildlife and nature, and in fact, I just have uh, this, it just got delivered here a few weeks ago. I got this macro lens. So I'm trying to take photos of, you know, bugs and, and yeah, stuff Yeah, I know like the early pictures with the birds were super interesting as well. That's what I'm doing yeah. with the lockdown. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, because Bobby had to take out. Looking for yeah. small things to photograph. I know, it might as well, you know, make make the most out of it, right? Because there's always, you know, there's always something to... Uh, so much. To. <laughs> yeah, but it also yeah, keeps you yeah. busy. It keeps your mind kind of yeah. engaged because you've got to get the shot right and you've got to right. set it up properly. So it's also yes. a good, you know, mental exercise with an aesthetic, you know, byproduct. So that's also nice, yeah, yeah. right? Exactly right. And the yeah. thing with, you know, the thing I, I always ask people, because people always now ask, I was like chatting to some clients a few weeks ago, just... You know, and I'm again probably not the expert there, but then now people are now wanting like, because you know your shot for for like your own portfolio will be very different from your Instagram shot. Mm -hmm. So people are so focused now on hey, what will look good on Instagram? How do I you know because Instagram is a square format, it's a different um, you know different I guess angle or style. Mm -hmm. Which I'm, you know, trying to to study as well, but it's difficult, right? I think. But do it's, you use it's, Instagram lit? Do you use it at all? Do you show your photos on Instagram? Yeah, no, it, I just, you know, I have, I, I kind of have a password to the A to A account, so yeah, so I, I kind of post there, yeah, so you can see a lot of the, the photos there are from. But I don't have my personal yet. I think it's a lot of, you know, probably a lot of work once you start having your own <laughs> account. So I just use the. Although on Facebook, you know, my personal on Facebook, I just, yeah. yeah, that's why Bobby with Manolo and those guys, we always try to, you know, kind of. But on Facebook, are you yeah, limited to that square format as well? I, I, I don't remember. No, no, you're not. No, Facebook is, um, it's more, uh, you know, like you're normal, like you're. Uh, Go to Apple. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very different, you know, but photograph is more, uh, Facebook, so it's more like personal, you know, it's like. Like my thing is just for friends and clients and yeah, but um, no, but it's good. You know, it's fun. You know, as you've seen, like and and I tell people, like you know, people, your first, uh, you know, ninety percent of the equation mm -hmm. is you know those photos I showed you. If anyone, you could go to any of these like the Altiplano, right? You could actually just not even look at your viewfinder and just keep on just rand take random photos and it will come out beautiful. So that's you know. It's kind of unfair, I guess, because the the, the location is it's it's it does ninety percent of the job for yeah. you, and then of course you need to need to find your own technique. But uh, yeah, like in Cape Town, we're so we're so fortunate here. It's just yeah. so beautiful. And are you self-taught? Would you call yourself a self-taught photographer? Yeah, 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 definitely. You know, you know this thing about the ten thousand hours, right? I think I'm yeah. definitely. Uh, the 10,000 hours, but I never, yeah, I never took any, um, you know, when I was younger, I was living in New York, I, I did one summer course in NYU and in photography, uh -huh. but it is a different time then. Uh, but, you know, when digital started, then it just, you know, your, your learning curve just, you know, mm -hmm. just it comes up so fast. It's so easy now, right? You know, yeah. I remember film days, you know, I used to go on safari. I, I had no idea what my photos looked like until I, you know, and then you would have, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, we had them, I had these like x ray bags because I was so paranoid that these x ray machines at the airport would actually yeah, wipe yeah. out. Yeah. It was so stressful. Like, so, because, you know, I'd come back and then I have like 50 rolls of shots and then they, they, they zapped all of this in, uh, you know, in the Joburg airport. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's fun, you know. It's a good, it's a good hobby for. I, I can see, I can see more and more people now taking taking to it because this digital revolution has actually made it. Um, you know, it's a game changer, right? Mm -hmm. Accessible now. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For uh, for photography. So anyone can take good photo. That, that's a good thing now because before it was a bit daunting, you know. Oh, I'm not. Yeah, I don't have the equipment. I, you know, it's all film. But now I think you can you can teach yourself. And you know, Google is so. Yeah. I, you know, another thing. I know people are asking, how do you actually before we go right but you know what i do when when people i tell people when you're going to let's say you're going to patagonia for example then you know google your research and then see what people have taken right and then you learn you know and then i always tell people as well you know it's a there's a, there's always going to be these classic shots in like in peru like there's a rainbow mountain which everyone takes the same view uh and then when you get there Take that shot, but at the same time, you know, move around, try to find your own, you know, your own, make oh, your yeah. own. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, Google is good. So, you know, read, you can find anything on Google now, right? How do I photograph a sunburn? You know, how do I photograph a mountain gorilla? Then you'll get articles and the research is important huh, of your, uh, your, your destination. I guess another trip would be to bring a memory card or to have enough memory on your phone. Right, because you'll be paying. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right, you need to have all the what one twenty two fifty six gig uh, yeah. in videos. Right, people are taking a lot of videos now, um, and those things actually take a lot of uh, take a lot yeah. of space. Unless you download every night and then. Yes. Yeah. 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 I used to do that. You know, I used to bring like all these uh, what do you call them like hard drives and um, you yeah. know like laptop, but you. Know, because I was in the beginning, but I think now I feel I've actually, you know, if I if I go on a trip, if I lose these photos, I mean, bummer, but it's not the end of the world, right? I'll just go back. And uh, yeah, well, cause you have a chance to go back all the time. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, but now, you know, I think if you're using these Canons and Sonys, I mean, good brands, you know, I, I, knock on wood, I've never had, a, you know, what, 25, 30 years I've never, oh, no. When did maybe digital started in 2003, four, so almost 20 years. I actually haven't had a card kind of you know conk out to me. Oh, you just get the good brands, yeah. Just get yeah. the good, you, know, you have these, you know, in, in your SLRs, you have these, they call them extremes, you know, like the ones with uh, you know, like your temperature range is higher, so we go a lot to like these very hot and cold places, right? And humid, yeah. So I think that's it for today. I think we learned so much. We've seen like some really, really, really amazing photos. So thank you, Lit, for joining us today oh, and sharing you. your wonderful you, and your little tips. Yeah, it's been great. And thank we'll have you again. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for Yeah, yeah. If, if anyone wants to, yeah, Bambina or anyone, if you want to just ping me, if you want to, hey, let's have a night photography session. You know, we can. We can do an hour on any of them, right? Whether it's aerial or night or portraits or wildlife or birds. Yeah. Happy to do that. Yeah. yeah. And and when you're planning your next trip, I think we're all itching to leave as soon as we're vaccinated or, you know, some people around the world are also vaccinated. So we'll yeah, I know. Forward to yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So soon, hopefully soon, yeah, we'll, we'll get the, the vaccine yeah. rollout going and thanks yeah. noel for joining us today yeah Bye. thanks noel hope you hope you enjoyed yeah yeah